So thank you for attending um, this webinar hosted by the Canadian Network of Community Land Trust as part of our webinar series. Um, the title of today's webinar is Origins and Evolutions of the Community Land Trust in Canada. And uh, it's a webinar and it's also a Canadian book launch of On Common Ground International Perspectives on Community Land Trusts. So uh, I'd like to start um, uh, with the land recognition. So we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather today, um, and I'm speaking from the um, being in Toronto, uh, is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, and most recently the territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory is a subject of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peace peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This territory is also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. Today, the meeting place of Toronto from the Haudenosaunee word, Takaronto, is still the home of many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. And we are extremely grateful to have the opportunity to work, present um, and share um, in this territory. So um, for this webinar, um, I'll be playing the role of host. And uh, my name is Joshua Barnes. Um, I, I come to this work and interest in community land trust as, as a resident of Toronto in the Parkdale neighborhood, but also as the executive director of the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust, and, and really honored to um, have the you know and privileged to be working with this amazing community here in Parkdale. And um, through our work, we recently got engaged with a national network called the Canadian Network of Community Land Trust, which we were also able to co-found. Um, so a little bit about the network. So the Canadian Network of Community Land Trust is a knowledge sharing forum. Uh, we are creating a pan-Canadian community to ensure the success and growth of the Community Land Trust CLT model through Canada. Our goal is a healthy ecosystem of community owned affordable housing and other real estate assets in urban areas. The Community Land Trust or CLT um, can be either community or sector led they are nonprofit organization, organizations which acquire and hold land in the interests of their community. CLTs operate on a variety of scales, choosing to present, uh, represent either neighborhoods, cities, or regions. Um, CLTs are long-term stewards of affordability, and they work to ensure perpetual affordable housing and also to secure other community spaces, including spaces for nonprofits, social enterprises, and other community uses. Currently, we understand there are about uh, between 20 and 30 active CLTs across Canada um, and it's growing movement. Um, I should also say that the network is currently ad hoc. And so all of these activities that we're organizing are organized um, by volunteers uh, who are passionate about um, community land. So um, for today's webinar, our objectives are to launch the on, uh, to have a Canadian book launch of On Common Ground International Perspectives on the Community Land Trust. We seek to share a story, um, and it's just a story of the origin and evolution of the Community Land Trust model in Canada. And we're gonna do that by profiling some of the inspiring um, Canadian CLTs that we're in contact with today. There are others which we haven't met yet or um, don't know or who couldn't be here today. And so um, there's, there are definitely many other stories of, of this movement. We also seek to increase the knowledge about different models and approaches to organizing around community land trusts in Canada and again, to inspire the growth of this community land interest movement. So here's a look at our agenda. Um, we've just completed the welcome and uh, we're about to pass um, the torch over to John Davis, who is uh, one of the co-authors on, um, on, on, on Common Ground. We'll, uh, we'll hear from, from John about, about this amazing new book and what you can find in it and some amazing other resources about community land trust internationally. We'll then move um, into a discussion of the origins of the community land trust model in Canada in terms of um, the organizations which first started to, to use the model and identify uh, themselves and their work under that model. We'll hear from Susanna Bunce, um, a professor at U of T, John Harstone, who's representing the Cooperative Housing Federation of Toronto, and Dimitri Rosopoulos from uh, La, La, La Milton Park community. 
And um, well, then we'll move to some of the newer CLTs that have popped up since 2012, which we call the second generation CLTs. Um, and uh, we're gonna hear from Stephanie Allen at Hogan's Alley Society in Vancouver. I'll present a little bit about the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust in Toronto. We'll hear from Tiffany Duzita in Vancouver. Uh, and then we'll um, discuss emerging issues nationally and, uh, and move to a question period at the end. So again, um, as we go through the presentations, if you do have questions, you can put them down immediately into the chat bar. We'll be monitoring that, but also save them for the end and uh, put them then and we'll, we'll also come to them. Um, thank you so much. So um, I'd like to invite John Emmis Davis um, to present. Um, John is the former housing director of Burlington, Vermont. He's a partner of Burlington Associates in Community Development and co-director of the Center for Community Land Innovation. Uh, he is also the editor-in-chief of Terra Nostra Press, a wonderful new um, publishing, publisher who is focusing on community land and the co-editor of On Common Ground, International Perspectives on the Community Land Trust. For those of you who don't know, John is also considered the grandfather of community land trusts in the United States um, and is uh, one of my favorite historians on, on, on um, urban community land. John, the, the torch is yours. Okay, why don't we go to the next slide if we could. So thank you for inviting a token yank to your Canadian webinar series. I am speaking to you today from Burlington, Vermont. And I appreciate this opportunity to introduce this new book about community land trusts. It was published only a few weeks ago. The title of the book, as you can see, is On Common Ground, International Perspectives on the Community Land Trust. I'm one of three co-editors and one of 42 authors from a dozen different countries who contributed 26 original essays to this collection. Um, we can go to the next slide. One of the challenges we had in pulling together this collection is that with so many authors from different cities and from different countries, we had an unusual challenge. We're writing a book about community land trust, but what is a CLT? Uh, from country to country, sometimes from city to city within the same country, uh, community land trusts have different meanings, applications, configurations throughout the world. So we started out by giving our authors a prompt. Next slide, please. And this prompt corresponds to the three basic components of a community land trust. That is how a CLT is structured, how the buildings on a CLT's land are managed, resold, stewarded, and how the land itself is owned. Next slide, please. We knew from the beginning However, that with so much, uh, so many differences from one country to the next, one city to the next, that there were going to be any number of variations in organization, operation, and in, um, in ownership. Um, so we decided that we would accept those variations. We would uh, encourage the variations. We would not insist on any kind of rigidity, any kind of orthodoxy. Next slide, please. But what we discovered from country to country is that there really was sort of general agreement, indeed common ground among all of authors in seeing that in this case of a community land trust, that the whole of a CLT was greater than the sum of its parts. Next slide. It was a general agreement that what gives a CLT vitality and resilience and the power to transform a place-based community is the combination of community, land, and trust. Next slide. The genius of the CLT comes not only from the reinvention of each component, but
but from the harmony, the synergy that comes from combining those components. That, and this was a, a common theme that is woven throughout the book, this idea that it's the combination of these elements that despite their many different variations, when you push them together, that's where the power of the CLT comes from. Next slide, please. So let's turn to the book itself. As Joshua mentioned, it's published by Terra Nostra Press, which is an imprint that we created in order to allow the editors and the sponsoring organization, the Center for Community Land Trust Innovation, to exert a degree of control over the content and the design that you would not uh, normally derive from working with a traditional publisher. But we also wanted to have control over the pricing because we wanted to make sure that this book and the products derived from it were as accessible and affordable to as many people in as many countries as possible. We're also in the process of translating the entire book into Spanish. And if we are successful in raising some additional money, we hope to translate parts of the book into French and into Portuguese as well. Next slide. The book's 26 chapters are arranged in five parts. Part one looks at the philosophical and the practical justifications for this unusual approach to community-led development of permanently affordable housing on community-owned land. <clears throat> Next slide. Part two examines the national networks of CLTs that have emerged in the United States, in Canada, in England, and in Europe. Part three, the next slide, explores the growth of CLTs in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in South Asia, and in Africa. So whereas most CLT development to date has been in the global north, we wanted to highlight the spread of the model to countries in the global south. Next slide, please. Part four is a collection of case studies of CLTs in London, Brussels, and several US cities that are developing affordable housing but also doing commercial development and urban agriculture. So we wanted to uh, spotlight the sheer diversity of applications and uh, projects that CLTs are engaged in around the world. Finally, part five is devoted to self-reflection and self-criticism. We wanted, wanted to look at how CLTs can meet challenges posed by systemic racism, by environmental change, by the political uh, challenges that are going to arise in the years ahead, both to the work that we do and to the model itself. Next slide. So we're going to spend most of our time today focusing on uh, themes, cases covered by chapter seven, uh, the one that focuses on community land trust here in Canada. But before I leave the stage, let me mention that for this chapter and for many of the chapters, we are developing audiobooks that uh, where the chapter is read either by the authors or by uh, a colleague. And then we are making these audiobooks available uh, for free, free streaming, free download from the website of the Center for Community Land Trust Innovation. Again, part of our commitment to trying to make these materials as widely available, as accessible as possible. And finally, in the next slide, let me uh, also mention one other thing about trying to make these materials affordable and accessible. Uh, 
we are in the process of collecting, selecting, packaging groups of five or six chapters on a common theme in separate monographs and making those available very, very inexpensively. So, and, um, and we're also going to be translating those into uh, to other languages. The first one that we have published is in Spanish. It's the chapters that focus on CLT development in Latin America and the Caribbean. The next one that will be published in the next few days and the next monograph will be why community land trust, which are the practical philosophical justifications for the model. So with that as an overview for the book as a whole, why don't we turn it over to uh, Susanna Bunce and she can talk about the chapter that looks at Canada. Great. Thank you, John. So Josh, I don't know if you want to introduce me or should I introduce myself or? I think you can introduce yourself actually. Yeah. Hi everyone, thanks for being here today. Um, I'm, as John and Josh mentioned, I'm Susanna Bunce. I'm an associate professor in the geography and planning department at the University of Toronto. So my research has focused largely on the local politics of land use, local socio-environmental processes and community-based land use planning and land stewardship, as well as increasingly more so around the issue of affordable housing and communities. Um, so from 2009 to about 2014, I had a funded research project uh, funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada on community land trusts. So looking at a comparative analysis of community land trusts in cities in Canada, the US and the UK. And since the funding has terminated, I've been uh, doing different types of projects around community land trusts since then uh, with different uh, pockets of funding here and there. So a long standing interest in community land trusts, um, which is really exciting to have this uh, presentation tonight webinar today. So I just want to uh, start by providing an overview of the chapter that Josh and I wrote for the book uh, entitled Origins and Evolution of Urban Community Land Trusts in Canada. And so John invited us to write this chapter about a year and a half ago, and it was a really wonderful process between Josh and I in terms of really thinking through some of the issues around community land trust evolution in Canada. And so it provided us with an opportunity to bring together different understandings of Canadian CLT development with an eye to producing a chronological study of CLTs across the country. So we started with an inventory first of the CLTs that we knew about through my research and Josh's knowledge, extensive knowledge of CLTs across Canada. And so by doing so, we tried to create a fairly comprehensive list of CLTs across the country. So we also understand that we wouldn't have the space in a chapter with a very limited word count of about 6,000 words, I think, to mention every land trust in Canada. So we, we made the difficult choice to highlight the CLTs that we were most familiar with or that had had a significant impact in terms of their longevity. So this is absolutely not to say that other CLTs that aren't mentioned are not as important as the ones that we do discuss in the chapter, but just to say that we highlighted a few. So we identified two key temporal phases of CLT development in Canada, which we named as a fairly long first generation of CLTs from 19, the 1980s to 2012, and a shorter second generation of CLTs from 2012 to the current time. So I'll mention the characteristics of first generation CLTs in a subsequent slide, and Josh will be explaining the characteristics of second generation CLTs later in the webinar. So our chapter starts with situating Canadian CLT development within the context of larger structural and systemic changes in governance, urbanization, and affordable housing provisions since the 1980s. Of significance for CLTs during this period was the retraction of government funding for affordable housing starting in, largely in 1994 with the federal government retraction from affordable housing. Um, and seeing CLTs uh, filling the gap to address this challenge. We've also witnessed an increase in gentrification in cities, increasing struggles around, sorry, around housing affordability with booming property markets in major Canadian cities, a tight supply of affordable rental housing, and increasing prices for home ownership, even in the middle of a pandemic. So in Toronto, we're still having a housing boom in housing prices, even in the midst of a pandemic. 
Um, what we see in both phases of community land trust development is that CLT organizations have responded to the real need for affordable land and housing in Canada, as well as they've responded to the challenges caused by the governmental retraction of involvement in social care and pressures caused by gentrification and private property development. And that CLTs have galvanized important community engagement around these issues. So next slide. Josh, can you switch to the next slide, please? I, I did change the next oh. slide. Are you not seeing it? Yeah, OK. I think it's different on my screen, sorry. Um, so we suggest that, um, so in terms of the um, first uh, generation uh, CLTs, um, we suggest that um, there are so two temporal phases of CLT development. Um, so the first being from the 1980s to the 2012, as I mentioned, uh, and the second being from 2012 onwards. Um, so we've organized today's webinar presentations generally in relation to this chronology. So I will discuss the characteristics of the first generation. And then John Harstone and Dimitri Rosopoulos will be discussing two of the CLTs that emerged in this period. So Clan Co in Toronto and Milton Park in Montreal, respectively. So the first generation of CLTs were small in number, really just a handful, and developed in relation to a robust co-op housing movement in Canada, as well as a decreasing interest by governments in funding affordable housing and an increased interest by community organizations in community-based development, as well as how communities could engage in owning land and developing their own affordable housing at the neighborhood scale. So two types of CLTs that we emerge, that we, that we see emerge in this period are the sector-based, uh, CLT, which is a term that refers to the affordable housing uh, sector. So CLTs that are largely citywide in focus. Examples of, of this are Colanco in Toronto, which is focused on a co-op housing portfolio across the GTA, and Vernon and District CLT in, in Vernon, BC, which is a citywide and CLT that consists of affordable housing pr providers such as Habitat for Humanity. The second type of CLT that we see in this phase is a community-led neighborhood-based CLT, so which emerges more from the community development sector. It focuses on neighborhood preservation, community-based development and engagement, and collective land ownership for the provision of affordable housing. So examples are Milton Park in Montreal, which we'll hear about in a second, as well as the West Broadway CLT in Winnipeg, which was started through the West Broadway Community Development Corporation, one of the first American models of CDCs in Canada, and that was started in 1999. So these CLTs galvanized public interest in CLTs and some had a central role in the production of a 2005 report done for the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation on CLTs that are as being a viable model for affordable housing. And that report is titled Critical Success Factors for Community Land Trusts in Canada. It's available online for anyone who is interested in reading this. I know we have uh, one of the authors, John Harstone of the report uh, here to talk to us today. Um, just, so I will want to mention, I don't know if you have another slide there, Josh before going into Dimitri's talk, or sorry, John's talk. So just before I introduce John, um, I would like to mention that there are CLTs that we mentioned in our chapter that I didn't, that uh, I briefly mentioned today, but that we don't have representatives from to speak about uh, in the webinar today, but um, that were very central to the first phase of CLT government and development. And that is the Central Edmonton CLT, which was formed in 1998. Uh, I mentioned the West Broadway CLT in Winnipeg, which was formed in 1999. The Calgary Community Land Trust, which is now home space, um, that was formed in 2003. And I mentioned the Vernon and District Community Land Trust in the Okanagan region of BC, which was formed in 2008. So I'll pass it in here and pass it over to John Harstone to speak about a Kalanko and Cooperative Housing Land Trusts. And then Dimitri Rosopoulos will speak after John speaks, just to situate those two land trusts within this broader framework of the first phase of community land trust development. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'm John Harstone. I've been asked to speak a bit about what the co-op sector in Toronto has been doing around land trusts. 
I've been actually working, developing affordable housing since 1974, which is an awful long time ago. Um, for about six years, I actually was the executive director, the manager of the, um, the land trust uh, here in Toronto. Um, when the development in, of new projects wound down, I went off and started doing a lot of other independent consulting and worked with a group called St. Clair's where we built an awful lot of really interesting housing. Anyway, um, so I've been keeping my hand in this for a long time and really pleased that this uh, seminar is happening. Josh, let's move on. How do I do that? There must be a way I could, oh, there it is. Using land trusts to develop housing co-ops and what we've done in Toronto. Okay, next one, please. Um, all right. So the Co-op Housing Federation of Toronto is a, uh, a member uh, organization. Its membership are the, the individual housing co-ops that are operating in the, the greater Toronto area. And um, each of these housing co-ops gets to elect one representative to uh, attend meetings of the Co-op Federation from which they in fact uh, then elect a board of directors. So the Federation is a member run organization that is, doesn't receive money from the government, it's entirely dues funded. And um, for a long discussion about, um, about land trusts. And we were fortunate at some point to just be able to jump in and start doing it. So the, I'm gonna talk about four land trust for various reasons we created for land trust. The Bathers Key Community Land Trust, Co-Lanco, the Tennis Nonprofit Redevelopment Co-op, and Naismith. We actually at this moment have um, 32 units in our land trust. Uh, next slide please, Josh. Uh, there, Bathers Key. Um, we're opportunistic. When opportunities come available, we try to grab it. And sometimes the land trust model is the right one to do. The government of Canada uh, was leasing on a long-term basis land down on the waterfront on which we built three co-ops. The government, federal government decided to get out of the land business down there and said they were gonna give that land to the city of Toronto. Our response driven entirely by the co-ops that are down at water and the waterfront that is key was let's not have it go to the city let's set up a land trust and it was really interesting so we got a land trust in which uh, the co-op federation appoints five directors the city appoints four there are 266 units in the the three land trusts you can see some pictures of what's there the kind of buildings all of this is new construction next slide please All right, Colanco. This is actually the first and the sort of the 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 the, the, the central land trust we got here. It's incorporated in 1986. We managed to get a grant from. Well, what we've been trying to do in the entire nonprofit sector is figure out how to get developers to recognize their damn well should be community benefits if they're going to do projects, and so one of the first uh, community benefit agreements that was ever struck was um, in back in 1985, in which some funding became available. It ended up being used to establish the uh, Colanco. And so we took that initial working capital and uh, developed 13 projects with 4,346 4, units. Not bad. <clears throat> I can't say that we um, it probably should be realized that we became land developers. A land trust here, we're a land development company building. We actually lost money on a couple of projects, but the overall, and we made money on the other few other, overall, we were able to break even and be able to get these projects working. Of course, in 1995, when all the funding ended, whoosh, that was the end of doing new projects. And so Colanco hasn't had a project then. But essentially, CHFT made a decision that any project they initiated would be done through a land trust. And that's still a situation that's going on today. 
Next slide, please. Um, simultaneously with Colanco, uh, another non, uh, land trust was established, which was focusing on redevelopment. The tenants movement in Toronto was very strong and decided that they wanted to see as much of the affordable rental housing socialized as possible. And a land trust was set up to make that happen. And before the funding disappeared, uh, the uh, TNRC was able to acquire, with the help, support, and total agreement of the tenants, because the tenants were key to making this happen. 13 buildings with 654 units. Some of these buildings are 100 years old. Some of them were only 30 years old, but we were able to, to preserve a large number of, of buildings. Uh, today, these buildings are being picked up by, similar buildings are being picked up by private developers who are uh, rent evicting the tenants, raising the rents and making, ending the affordable housing. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, Josh, are we having? Can I? Ah, Naismith. Um, so a couple of years ago, when it became pretty clear that there was a sort of a, a lack of initiatives, we thought we needed to create a new and more sort of versatile uh, land trust, which could address the kind of challenges that uh, were coming forward. One thing was that the city of Toronto was compelling developers to provide affordable housing and to transfer units to nonprofits. And so one of the things which we did with Naismith was set up a body where we could actually take units in downtown condos. So we've got our first 12 units and we're working right now to acquire um, units in other condos. We're also looking at a couple of other development opportunities which are much, which are much larger and trying to figure out how we can make, um, make the new, new developments within this Naismith. And so this is the one that um, we're doing. But I also point out here, we're talking about not just expanding the co-op sector, but to stabilize it. Because the other thing that we've realized is that many of the older co-ops and nonprofits are having some difficulty with management. And so when we talk about stabilization, we are looking at some of the projects which are running into financial difficulty being taken over and put into the land trust um, as a way to ensure that there's better financing and better governance. So we're really trying to look at the land trust as a model that can uh, really work uh, to, to improve the entire nonprofit housing um, uh, sector. Okay, next trust, the next, next slide, please. There. So the things about the Toronto Co-op uh, land trust is we're talking about affordable housing. None of this stuff is uh, ownership, although the ownership units, and by the way, I should mention, which wasn't done, that there's a 250 unit uh, ownership land trust in Toronto as well in the Toronto Islands, but um, it's all rental. Approximately 50% uh, of the residents in our land trust are receiving some form of rental assistance. Very often they're on uh, some form of social assistance as well. And the typical rents are below the average market rents, perhaps between 70 and 90%. So they are extremely affordable in terms of the city. Now, in terms of the governance, what we have done is CHFT appoints the land trust boards. Um, as it turns out, very often there are residents of the leasing co-ops on those boards, but it's not a requirement. But the leasing co-ops themselves run uh, the operations on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, many of the people in the operating co-ops don't even know they're on land trust land. In fact, it doesn't matter at all because, to be quite honest, what's important is operations, not who owns the land. The leasing co-ops, therefore, elect their own board of directors and handle all those day-to-day -day affairs. The land trust has given those co-ops a 49-year lease. Uh, 49, weird number, but if you go beyond 50 years, you have to pay land transfer tax. And so that is the, um, the reason for the 49 years. And we're looking at various ways of, of now, as 
those leases are moving towards maturity. Some of them are like within uh, 15 years of talking to the land trusts about what happens after the, the lease. It's not necessarily going to be an automatic renewal. We're talking about how we can make these co-ops more sustainable, how we can create a more dynamic uh, affordable housing sector in the, in the Toronto area. I think that there may be one more slide. There it is. Oh, and it's got Tom Clement, who's the executive director at the Cooperative Housing Federation, as being the contact person for this. Tom's actually the guy in, who is, is, is supposed to have been here, and then I took his place for this. And so um, that's the end of, um, of this presentation. We can go on to hear about Milton Park. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. Um, and so um, without further ado, we are going to uh, bring on another historic organizer of, of co-op housing and community land trust. I'd like to invite uh, Dimitri Rosopoulos from the Milton Park community um, to, uh, to the stage. And um, Dimitri, um, the stage is yours. And Dimitri, I'll just, you need to unmute your, um, your microphone. Uh, a, a very, Perfect. a very warm welcome and to, uh, greetings to all my sisters and brothers who are participating in this very interesting and important event. Uh, and congratulations to the organizers. I would like, however, to take a minute, uh, less than a minute perhaps, to recognize something of great historical and political significance. Today is August the 6th, as we know, and 75 years ago today, the American government dropped the first atomic bomb on a Japanese city called Hiroshima and 140,000 people were murdered. This was a crime against humanity. And all over the world today, we are recognizing the significance of this date, which by the way, not being enough to murder one city, uh, the American government went on two days later on August the 9th to bomb another Japanese city called Nagasaki. Having recognized this day, this commemorative day, I then want to go on to talk about the subject in hand. And of course, in 10 minutes or more, it's not possible to deal with all of the six points that um, the organizers put before us. I'll try to cover as much ground as possible and I look forward to a very engaging discussion which can clarify various uh, aspects of uh, this presentation and the other presentations. <clears throat> uh, I'm an economist by education. I've also uh, played my part as a community and political organizer, as a publisher, and many other activities over a reasonably long life. Uh, the drama of this major uh, event began in 1968. And so uh, it went on for many years through very basic community organizing, utilizing, by the way, many of the values and many of the techniques that were pioneered in, in the famous 60s when we did uh, very much to promote the whole notion of community organization of the underclass and also uh, <clears throat> to um, empower uh, people who had no power in our society. Uh, the Milton Park community was a historic community filled with heritage Victorian housing built at the end of the 19th century in the beginning of the 20th century and the developer so-called developer, uh, we, I refer to them as speculators, they wanted to demolish this six block area and build uh, high-rise apartments and 
and the shopping malls and hotels and so on and so forth. This is their press conference of 1968 with the premier of Quebec and other, <laughs> other characters. And you could see a little bit of a model at the bottom of the, of the screen of the buildings that they wanted to uh, construct. And this was for another class of people. And therefore, there it is again, they would have had to drive the entire population out of this downtown area. And we had to fight this off and we did. And we used every uh, trick, uh, every militant activity, every uh, instrument of public education and of community organizing to bring people together. And um, one thing has to be realized is that our city suffer from uh, a major uh, issue, a major problem, and that is massive urbanization. And so there are all sorts of corporate interests that want to uh, uh, take over our cities, own the land, own the buildings, and put up all sorts of things that are of no uh, social redeeming quality or of public interest. And we went through the whole gamut of organizing. Here is our community newspaper which uh, reported that on, in, uh, on a particular day, we occupied the offices of the, of the speculator and there were mass arrests. And we had a trial uh, where we actually uh, won the trial. The, the charge was public mischief, which is a very serious uh, charge under the criminal code. Anyways, we held together and by 1982, uh, this is, uh, the trial was in 72, and we used various other tactics. Um, here you see is an example of um, the, the destruction that took place and what the monsters that they put up uh, to replace those beautiful houses that they destroyed. Uh, by 1982, we won the battle. This is an example of the kind of mass support that we had in our struggle that helped us convince uh, Ottawa and Quebec City and reluctantly the city government of Montreal to uh, allow us to uh, in effect buy the six or five block area in downtown Montreal. Now, one of the uh, very important characteristics of the Milton Park project is that uh, we avoided having one big co-op. Uh, but our vision from the beginning to create a cooperative community. And we had all sorts of social development projects that advanced that ideal. Uh, but at the core of our, our community are a number of cooperatives and nonprofits. For example, here on your right, you see a whole series of colors. Each represent uh, the 22 organizations that were largely self-organized around affinity, uh, neighbors getting together. And some of them are cooperatives, 16 of them are nonprofit cooperatives, and the rest are nonprofit housing associations, which allow people of a different uh, set of interests and capacities to also get secure housing. What is also very important to recognize is that uh, uh, the main federal housing organization, Central Housing and Mortgage Corporation, of course, wanted having uh, assured us and allowed us to get guaranteed mortgages to buy all this property and to renovate it up to the standard of the National Housing Code. They wanted us to say, well, now... Um, now that we've made all this public investment, the rents that members of these co-ops and nonprofits have to pay are the market rent. And of course, uh, that was another major battle that we undertook. And again, to make a long story short, we beat them uh, against the wall and they gave us uh, guarantees to allow all the original low income, poor people that lived in this neighborhood. 
and we're talking about roughly 1,400, 1,500 people in these 22 organizations, all federated together in one federation. Uh, all of these original people felt comfortable enough economically to continue to live in these wonderful renovated historic buildings. That's very significant. So if you don't fight the power structure, you don't get very far. That's the moral of that uh, story. Now, once we established all of that, and here is a, a slide showing the kind of community spirit that exists in, uh, in Milton Park. We have these annual events where hundreds of people come to eat and drink uh, and socialize and bond and uh, plan the weeks and months and years ahead. Um, at the core of all of this struggle was the Milton Park Citizens Committee, uh, of which I'm the current president. Without this committee that fought for 50 years, uh, the good fight, uh, we would not have succeeded. And we are also celebrating uh, 36 years of the career up here. And the community, Milton Park, is the land trust. Now, Dimitri, the just, uh, just want to let you know, we have two minutes left for your yeah. presentation. Thank you. Yeah, the land trust is uh, the, the fruit of a piece of legislation that was passed by the provincial legislature uh, that uh, created the land trust uh, around the federation of the 22 organizations. And this land trust has abolished private property. There is no buying and selling in this area that you see before you. That's very significant. So we are very proud to say that our land trust is clearly an anti-capitalist land trust where private property is not permitted. There can be no buying and selling. And we are now at the cusp of expanding our, our perspective towards two other big sites uh, one to the north, uh, immediately to the north, and one to the north uh, west of two large hospital sites which have been emptied by the provincial government, one consisting of one million square meters, and the second one consisting of 800 square meters. And we want to build more nonprofit cooperative housing. Here is one of them, uh, the Hotel Dieu project. And Again, uh, Milton Park, the story of Milton Park is an unfolding story. These are kinds of the community assemblies. Here's, here's what we want to do with that site, which includes uh, where, you, where you see the green, the lime green is um, uh, new, new cooperative housing with, with, um, with or, uh, urban agriculture and all the rest of it. So it is an unfolding story. Uh, we are a community filled with combatants who want to uh, take the word of uh, the security of this kind of housing uh, into the future. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Uh, this is, this is the book that we published last, uh, last fall, by the way, uh, talking about books. <laughs> Villages, so, villages and cities, recommended uh, by, uh, by some top uh, innovators. Yes, thank you so much, Dimitri. Um, uh, it's really great to hear about the struggle of, of the Milton Park community. Thank you so much for sharing about that. So uh, we're about to get to the second generation of CLTs um, that, uh, that were um, some of them that were highlighted in the, in the article uh, that Sue and I published in, in On Common Ground. So from 2012 to present, um, we've seen a resurgence in CLT development with nine new CLTs established since 2014. This is super important to, to identify because as we heard from John and, and Dimitri, there was a early spur of CLT development. And then with the defunding of affordable housing programs by all levels of government uh, by the mid 1990s, um, the community land trust growth sort of came to a halt. 
uh, and um, some organizations which have secured land prior to that um, you know, became sort of stewards of those lands and continued to be good stewards to their communities and the, the housing owned within them, um, but uh, had struggles uh, continuing to expand their, their impact and provide more benefit to more people in their community. But um, from 2012 on, we see new groups emerge that are um, sort of re-engaging re, uh, re the community land trust uh, model. And, uh, and it sort of coalesced more recently in the establishment of the, the Canadian Network of Community Land Trusts in 2017, which was an effort to sort of try to organize, um, you know, more discourse between groups who are interested in, in, in organizing around CLTs. So we continue to see um, sort of two groupings of, of CLTs uh, in this, this new round of CLTs, the second generation. We see sector-led CLTs, um, sort of similar to um, the Co Cooperative Housing Federation of Toronto CLTs. Um, so there's the, the sector-led CLTs of specific characteristics. There's the emergence of CLTs as expert-led nonprofit housing developers, a commitment to perpetual affordable housing on community-owned land, um, CLT is a vehicle for stewardship, renewal, and development of large housing stocks of affordable housing. Uh, a focus not just on one type of housing, but on a range of housing tenures, including rental, co-op housing, supportive housing, and affordable home ownership. And the CLT led or the sector led CLTs, it's important to note um, that they often do not utilize the tripartite board structure, um, which is characteristic of the more community led community land trusts. Um, so some examples of these sector-led CLTs we discuss in the in the book um, are the Community Land Trust in Vancouver. We'll hear from Tiffany today from, from that group. Co-op Housing Land Trust, which we already heard from John, but there's sort of like a new um, effort to grow their housing stock. In Home Space, there's um, Home Space Society is a community land trust that's focusing on supportive housing and developing of large stocks of supportive housing in that city. And in Montreal, there's a new group, um, Technical Angus, um, which is a large new initiative with a land trust. Um, so here's, you'll see sort of like the, the scale of these types of developments. These are um, more uh, development oriented um, land trusts, which uh, are, are, as you see, in developing, you know, beautiful, uh, amazing buildings. There's also a, a, a set of groups um, that are community led CLTs. So they're initiated by residents, community agencies, radical planners, municipal staff, often as partners. Um, they're organized in response to the escalating affordable housing crisis in Canadian cities, rapid gentrification, and a renewed interest in community-based responses to these problems. Um, there's also an interest in responding to the increasing financialization of housing by bringing land out of the private market. Um, and of course, similar to the other CLTs, there's a commitment to the perpetual affordability of housing and other assets which are owned, uh, which are in community-owned land. Um, here's a, a list of some of the community-based CLTs we know about, and there's many that are actually emerging um, as, as groups that are initiating themselves. We have a group in, in downtown Toronto, in um, Chinatown, which is exploring a community land trust. We've heard about groups in Muskoka and other regions, and so there's some listed here, but, but there's many more that are emerging. Um, so um, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Stephanie Allen, our next speaker um, from the Hogan's Alley Society, um, to speak about the Hogan's Alley Society and their interest in a community land trust. And I'll, I'll actually let um, Stephanie um, provide, uh, you know, provide her introduction and share um, the context which, which you see fit um, and to introduce yourself and your work. Stephanie? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Josh. Um, I first want to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking today from the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I really want to situate myself as a descendant of enslaved people brought to this hemisphere um, and placed upon land that was stolen. And so it's important uh, for the organization that I work with, uh, Hogan's Alley Society, as well as in my day job at BC Housing, where I'm the AVP of Strategic Business Operations and Performance for the Provincial Housing Agency, that our work is very squarely grounded in um, equity and in social justice and in recognizing that we're not all coming to the table with the same um, privileges, we're not all coming to the same table with the same opportunities, and that for too many people in our country, uh, opportunities have been denied and people have suffered. Housing is an important opportunity to redress those things. And so uh, as I talk to you today, I'll be talking a lot about how Hogan's Alley Society is focused on that 
and that I do enjoy the opportunity to also focus on that in my day job. So, you know, for myself, I, I grew up in, in public housing, what we call public housing today. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. Thanks, Josh. Um, and, you know, I, my mother grew up in public housing in, in Guyana, the former British colony that was uh, stolen from the indigenous people there to set up uh, slave colonies. Um, you know, housing is a really important justice avenue for uh, people of African descent uh, all over the world. And it really uh, is fitting for us to be working on a land trust because of the origin story of land trusts in the United States. And that it was this real legacy and search for justice of black rural farmers in the Southern United States who had experienced the terror of enslavement and then uh, Jim Crow uh, laws and that were looking for a reprieve from the dominant um, white supremacist society that they were in. You know, the new community story is something I'm sure is familiar to most folks that work in um, the, the land trust area. And we're very proud to, to you know, work in honor of that tradition because our work is also situated in, in, that, in that aspect. So the Hogan's Alley uh, Land Trust has really been born out of that search for justice um, and dealing with anti-Black racism that has been systemically um, and unfortunately unleashed in Canada. Um, Hogan's Alley is a name that uh, was uh, coined to refer to an all mostly Black neighborhood that existed in Vancouver uh, in the late 1800s, moving into the early 1900s. It was a place where um, Black folks could live. Uh, and I say could live because there were restrictive covenants on title uh, across the, the, the territory here in, in Vancouver, and there were discriminatory housing practices. So racialized folks found the ability to live in this kind of corner of the city. It was the home of, of a lot of racialized groups, the Chinese, the Japanese, South Asian, um, at the time racialized white people from Greece, from Italy, um, and who were not part of the more dominant uh, European um, classes. So it was a really multi-ethnic area uh, and this was where black folks lived it had a proximity to the railroads where black men worked it had the opportunity for black women to start businesses um, of, we know black women have always worked outside of the home so their entrepreneurial efforts were really important to the community and there was also a heart of the community which was the church the ame fountain chapel church which was founded by the matriarch nora hendricks uh, grandmother to jimmy hendricks and so this community that established itself in the corner of vancouver um, was never kind of left to, to foster and to grow and to flourish in the ways that they had hoped and they had come to this place looking for that opportunity. Um, unfortunately, their presence in Vancouver attracted the, uh, the eye and the unwantedness of those who led and, and um, were elected to the institutions such as the city of Vancouver and, and their bureaucratic arms. And so over time, this community faced the worst of the systemic uh, planning, um, be, you know, policies and programs of the day. Um, the the land was zoned to industrial. It was the first zoning and, and, and land use plan in Vancouver that zoned this area to industrial, immediately devaluing people's homes. It then gave the city of Vancouver the opportunity to divest in the area, not invest in infrastructure, in the uh, roads, in the sidewalks. Um, you know, they left the, the public uh, realm to fall apart. And the folks there kind of got the message that they were, they were not wanted in this community. And so over time, as these kind of um, uh, pressures mounted on the community, it also included a, po a policing presence. And that meant that uh, people of African descent that lived there were targets of police. They were um, arrested. There was a beating death of a, of a black man in this neighborhood. Um, you know, it was really clear that folks were not feeling safe in this neighborhood. Then you fast forward to the 1950s and Canada adopts urban renewal from the United States. Um, it was a model, of course, of infrastructure and investment 
investment. It was a way to use um, public dollars that built highways and allowed for white flight to the suburbs to um, commute in and to their jobs and to the urban core, um, and also was used as a means to displace uh, racialized and low income communities. And so that was true in New York, it was true in St. Louis, it was true also here in Vancouver, um, with the plan being to move folks who were low income into um, other housing. And as you see in the next slide, thanks Josh, um, it was the Vancouver Redevelopment Study that came along to uh, really legitimize the urban renewal um, program here in Vancouver. And what they did, as you see on the screen, there was a map. They went door to door and they mapped what they called blight at the times or slum conditions. Um, of course, ignoring the fact that their willful neglect contributed to those slum conditions, they were very intentional about it. So as you see in the dark kind of orange areas, those were the areas that were identified as first priority for removal. And the two dark orange squares that are in the lower side of that were really the heart of the black community or the Hogan's Alley area. And now I wanted to also highlight that it, during this period, there was an active KKK presence here in Vancouver. So anti-black racism was not only systemic, but it was also violently interpersonal. Um, the presence of a Klan uh, um, organization, of course, is meant to send terror through the hearts of people that are racialized, particularly black and indigenous people, and that this was a, a part of the tactic of, of letting black folks know that they're unwanted. So through this process, um, the city of Vancouver was uh, seeking the funding to replace an aging roadway system, and they uh, went ahead and used that opportunity to route the roadway system directly over the heart of the community. So over the neglect and then through urban renewal, the displacement of the Black community in Vancouver was complete. People left the area, they went off to other locations. At the time, the racism was really ratcheting up against Chinese people. And so I think the Black community, which was very small at the time, we know that in Canada in 1911, the Laurier government banned the migration of Black people to Canada. Um, and even though that was overturned, um, it really did have a lasting impact on the immigration of Black folks to the country, despite the you know promise um, from from the, the British Commonwealth that people in British colonies should be able to move anywhere. There was a real specific um, you know, pushback on black people migrating uh, to Canada. So the population didn't grow very large and, and people took their chances of dispersal, of really trying to become more invisible and more integrated into the, into the community, despite the benefits of having a cultural community where there was interdependence and, and social capital that people developed. And we know stories from the historical record of people who left Hogan's Alley. Um, one family moved to a house. They bought a house in a, a not far off neighborhood. And by the time they arrived, there was a petition that had been circulated in the community uh, telling them that they were not wanted. So we see that here, you know, in this community and in this you know, country, there's still this really strong systemic anti-Black racism that was preventing this community from fostering and of course eventually destroyed it. Now I'll go to the next slide. So we fast forward to now, and I'll tell you a little bit about the efforts that I've been involved in with, along with my colleagues on the Hogan's Alley Society. Um, you know, it came uh, to the point where the city of Vancouver is looking at removing those aging roadways. They were deemed seismically unsound and really redeveloping the area of Vancouver known as the Northeast False Creek. You see the, the waterway just off to the north in that one uh, uh, architectural rendering. And as they were considering this redevelopment, uh, I had just been doing a paper in school about this uh, Hogan's Alley Society in my master's course, uh, which eventually became my thesis. And it was clear to me that when the city was planning this redevelopment, there was no mention of the Black community. There was no reference to this history. The history had been almost totally erased. And together with a number of community activists who had been working for decades to keep this memory alive, including descendants from this area, we, we staged a bit of a, of, a, of a disruption and we called the city to task on addressing and redressing the displacement of the black community. It was really important for us to see some degree of justice come out of what the city had done the predecessors of, uh, of the bureaucrats and the city council. You'll notice in the upper left-hand corner, there's an image there. 
and it shows two city owned blocks. Right now, those blocks are where the, that very small roadway system uh, is situated. The entire highway plan was scrapped eventually in Vancouver because there was some really substantial protesting that happened through Chinatown and other communities coming together because Chinatown was going to be next to be erased from the, from the landscape. And so those two city blocks are the lands that the city came to acquire by displacing uh, the, the community, the black community and some other, other residents there. So now that the city owns those lands, we said, well, you own those lands. Those lands should not be sold for profit. You should turn these into a community land trust. And so with that idea, one of my colleagues had, um, we really galvanized around that. And we galvanized the entire community, not only the black community, but more broadly speaking, we galvanized members of the broader community for a number of reasons. And, and I'll share with you why we found a community land trust to be our best option. Number one, a community land trust, of course, takes this land out of the speculation, uh, out of the private market. You could imagine what a couple city blocks are worth in downtown Vancouver, the most expensive, one of the most expensive cities in the world. And we were very clear that um, to put these lands up for sale would not only, you know, lose an important public asset forever, but it would put an extreme amount of gentrification pressure on the surrounding communities, which includes Chinatown. It also includes the downtown east side, where we know is Canada's poorest postal code. And we knew that as Black community members who ourselves are struggling for justice in Canada, we did not want to see harm done to anyone else. We we're also mindful that these lands were originally First Nations lands, and that to see these privatized and to see profit extracted from them would be a disservice to those communities as well. So that was, you know, some of the premise. We also know that, you know, it, it, affordable housing in this, this city is absolutely uh, um, impossible to secure. You know, I work in my day job, as I said, for BC Housing. We're constantly, you know, working with community members um, as the next presenter, uh, the Community Land Trust Foundation of Vancouver and others to develop more affordable housing opportunities. So this was a prime opportunity to see below market housing for people most in need. And the other part was that we saw this as an opportunity to hold and steward this land in perpetuity and to prevent any future displacement of community members. You know, we think about um, the ways that even though with good intentions, co-ops have evolved over uh, in Canada's history, we know that there's a lot of people that discuss their uh, exclusion and the discriminatory practices that can come from co-ops. So we've been really intentional about wanting to see an inclusive community um, for opportunities to prioritize Black and Indigenous and other racialized people, uh, disabled people, low-income people in this community, and to really make sure that we're seeing a just outcome from something that was horribly traumatic for the Black community. You know, Black people in Vancouver are just over 1% of the population. And with the recent homeless uh, count, we find that we're 6% unfortunately, of the homeless count. BC Housing and our partners in, in Metro Vancouver have implemented a race question for the very first time uh, in the province. So we're starting to get the data that shows us the disparities that continue to persist in our society, um, things that we know anecdotally, but now we have the, uh, the evidence. So as we have gone through this process, this has not been an easy process. Um, we are continually negotiating and protesting and advocating with the city of Vancouver. Um, it is not within their paradigm to simply give away a, a block uh, of prime real estate into a nonprofit community land trust. Um, but we're grateful for the partnerships that we have been able to develop with the CLT and other organizations, BC Housing, with organizations across Canada such as this network to really focus in on and advocate for this solution to what is a, a, a number of needs in community. One of the very positive things that have come since our advocacy began is Nora Hendricks Place. Nora Hendricks Place is 52 units of supportive housing that has taken folks who were experiencing homelessness 
Black and Indigenous folks primarily into um, uh, supportive housing, um, where they get the appropriate levels of support um, in order to help stabilize their lives. This was a provincial um, initiative across BC that these modular buildings were put up um, to house people who were homeless rapidly. And when the city of Vancouver approached our organization, which has now become considered the stakeholder of this site, um, to put this land on, to put this building on, we were very adamant that the that the housing prioritized Black and Indigenous people who we at the time anecdotally knew to be overrepresented. And since that building has been established, we've been working with the housing operator to develop our own organization's capacity to run housing such as supportive housing for people who have um, experienced homelessness and may have mental health and addictions complications. Um, and we are continuing to develop our, our capacity. We're not out of the woods yet. Uh, we have a ways to go, unfortunately. Um, we have proposed uh, an MOU with the City of Vancouver that would outline our working relationship together. We submitted that last April 2018, um, and we are finally starting to hear back from the City with a response to that MOU. But we are very aware that um, although we have a lot of technical capacity in our organization and strong partners, um, that the city of Vancouver is looking at a proposition that would give away a significant amount of their authority and power um, in a way that we ca are calling for because I think as a, as a person who works in institutions, again, uh, it's time that we have this reckoning in our country. It's long overdue that we come to terms with how many of us have held and, and retained power. And when I say us, I mean, you know, in organizations and institutions, we have retained power and it has had a disempowering impact on communities. It has a marginalizing impact. And so we know that our work is pushing up against some, some, some serious boundaries that exist in institutions that have been long premised on patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. Our work disrupts all three of those things. So I'm happy to leave it at that. I will keep we will continue to keep everyone posted on our progress, but we, we remain steadfastly committed for this project to maintain its goals of below market housing, rental housing, and, and amenities for community. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, that, was, that was an amazing presentation and, and thank you for your really amazing hard work and, and persistence on this project. Um, so uh, I'm going to be the next presenter and I just want to acknowledge that Teresa Portillo, our board chair, was going to be presenting with me but I had to take another meeting so um, I'll be presenting on my own uh, but want to thank Teresa for her hard work um, as, as the chair and, and of our board. So um, I work as the as staff with the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust um, and uh, so the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust is a neighborhood-based community-led CLT. Uh, we work in the Parkdale neighborhood of Toronto and we focus our energy primarily in South Parkdale, which is one of the last remaining working class communities in Toronto, um, and sorry, in downtown Toronto. Um, in our neighborhood, 34% of residents are low income, 32% of residents are recent immigrants, and 90% of residents are renters. And so as a community uh, of renters, um, of course, there is a shared struggle to maintain the affordability of land and housing, especially in, in a, the type of real estate market that we have in Toronto. So um, for the past decades, Parkdale and Toronto as a whole has been experiencing an unprecedented real estate boom, which has been characterized by blockbusting development, um, condo development primarily, and, and extraordinarily um, high rent increases. Um, for working class, low income, and vulnerable residents, um, this inequitable development is experienced as a form of, of social cleansing. Um, so residents uh, experience multiple forms of displacement and dispossession. Landlords or older landlords are pushing out long-term tenants to sell their buildings um, as empty as possible, which is more attractive to investors. New landlords, which are often corporate landlords, are pushing out long-term tenants to raise rents um, and increase profits for shareholders. Developers are purchasing land, knocking down existing assets, and building new developments that are exclusively high end for high end uses. This real estate boom is also um, resulting in the dispossession of very important community wealth, um, hard fought, hard, hard, hard won community wealth. So individuals and families 
um, uh, their, their wealth and their sort of cultural um, assets are being lost um, or made vulnerable by this process. Um, community assets are also being lost and, and some of these important community assets are, are, are assets like affordable housing, commercial units, um, community space and community space for nonprofits. So um, in response to this process of inequitable development in 2014, community members and representatives from seven local organizations in the Parkdale area established the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust. So the land trust was established as a community controlled nonprofit organization that would acquire and own land on behalf of this community and ensure that this land was the land which it, which it became the steward of would be used for community benefit. Um, and so when we think about community, um, the land trust uh, engages uh, residents of the community. So um, we have a broad based membership of community members, which includes renters, homeowners, business owners, and local nonprofit organizations. Um, anyone who lives or works in the neighborhood can actually become a member of the organization, uh, enabling them to participate in the dem democratic decision making processes um, and potentially even become a member of the board. Um, and so, um, land. Um, the land trust seeks to be the steward of land. Um, and then to assure that it's used for community benefit. And in particular, uh, we seek to assure that that land is used to benefit equity seeking community members. Um, the images you'll see there are, are the images of the Milky Way Garden, which was the first um, parcel of land which we had the, the, the honor to, to be a steward of. Um, it's a community owned urban agriculture space. Um, for the seven years prior to the land trust becoming the owner of this property, um, a, lo a, a local group of mostly immigrant gardeners um, led, led by an amazing um, lead gardener named Sonam um, had been growing food cooperatively on this site um, through an informal arrangement with a private landowner. Um, at a certain point that landowner decided to sell and through a collaboration between the land trust, the gardeners and a local charity um, named Greenest City, um, the land trust was able to secure the land in community ownership um, which is facilitating the continued use of and stewardship of these lands um, by the gardeners with uh, with Greenwich City continuing to participate too. Um, and so um, in addition, we've invited um, members of the gardener group, the, the group of gardeners, including Sonam, um, the lead gardener there, um, to become members of our board um, and assist with the organization's governance. So trust. So the CLT has a commitment to hold land in trust for the community and also to maintain the affordability in perpetuity. Um, so this isn't just a commitment, but we actually seek to build community trust through democratic and transparent governance processes. Um, you'll see there, that was our, our, our first AGM where the community um, members elected our first board, uh, our first community elected board. Um, so um, the board is, is a tripartite board structure similar to the classic CLT model with one third core members, which are people who live or work on the land that we own. Uh, one third community members at large and one third of, of organizational representatives from local nonprofits that serve equity seeking community members in our community. Um, and so um, all of these groups sort of share in the decision making process. Um, I should say that all um, to be a member of the board, you must also be a resident. And so that's a requirement. Um, you know, another aspect of trust is that we try to bring as many decisions to the members as possible and to facilitate collective processes to make decisions. So this was a consultation thinking about future um, directions for the organization. I should mention that our organization since its inception has been working, uh, the work has been grounded in a process of community planning, where we engage residents to identify um, local community needs, visions, and then also actions that we can take together. So we, we partner with other organizations and on, on the left, you'll see the community planning study, which was a study that was undertaken with 30 local organizations participating. And it's a plan for decent work, shared wealth and equitable, equitable development in Parkdale. And it's sort of a counter plan to the inequitable development that we are responding to. So we're thinking actually now about equitable development and, and the method that we're currently using or the methodology that we currently use at, at the land trust is it, it has these stages and it changes of course because we need to learn from our, our work. So um, we start with a, a community need a problem. We move to community action research on that problem. Through the research we name the problem as well as solutions and then we try to implement projects, community benefit projects that can address the problem. 
So I'm going to take you through uh, one of our, our first residential project and sort of how that methodology lands. Um, and so this is a, a photo of, a, of an eviction that occurred in 2015 at the Queen's Hotel, which was a rooming house, which was purchased by a developer. And that developer um, gave the tenants, 27 tenants, seven day eviction notice. It was totally unlawful, um, but nonetheless led to the, the loss of this housing. Um, and so the problem that we discovered is so it was identified by this flashpoint um, eviction was that there was a loss of rooming house, um, rooming houses are in our community and it was leading to the eviction, uh, to an eviction problem. So um, we hired a local uh, a community planner as well as uh, rooming house tenants as community-based researchers to investigate why rooming houses were being lost and to identify potential solutions. Um, so, um, by doing this study, which we call the Parkdale Rooming House Study, you can find it on our website, we were able to name the problem in a way that made sense to the community. Um, so, you know, we identified that real estate speculation and upscaling of the existing rental housing stock was causing a crisis of rooming house loss and evictions that were leading to increasing homelessness. We identified that 28 rooming houses had already been lost in the 10 years prior to the study which had displaced 347 residents. What was even more concerning, because it was, of course, was what hadn't happened yet, was that 50, we identified 59 tenanted rooming houses, which we perceived to be at risk of being lost. And in those buildings, there were 800 tenants um, living and potentially at risk of losing their housing. So with this data, um, we were able to organize um, to, to work with our community and partners uh, as well as to push government um, to try to invest our energy as well as resources into a solution. Um, so um, we were, were um, after many years of, of, uh, of, of failing projects, we actually had eight um, failed projects, we were able to implement a successful um, rooming house acquisition project. And so the, the land trust in 2009 um, acquired a 15 unit rooming house, which is a, a bachelorette building in South Parkdale. Um, through this pilot, um, we were able to um, secure the, the affordability of all the units, and now we prioritize units that become uh, vacant to folks who are experiencing homelessness to help folks get out of the shelter system. Um, we have committed to perpetual affordability and have a, a, an agreement with the city of Toronto to provide affordable housing on this site for 99 years, which is the longest legal agreement we could enter into. The land trust leases the property to uh, on a 49 year basis to a local charity named Park, um, which provides affordable housing with supports um, at this building. Um, so uh, through, this, um, through this initiative, we, we, you know, we believe that community ownership has actually been able to, you know, we've, through community ownership, we've been able to secure the community benefit um, of that affordable housing. And an important uh, other piece is that we do believe that um, the community equity in this building is being, is being preserved. At the beginning of, the, of, of my, my statements, I, you know, I mentioned that, you know, um, inequitable development is actually extracting wealth from the community. Um, and that's wealth that is, has been developed both from public investment, um, from tenants rent, from people's hard work running local businesses, from people's hard work volunteering and organizing in, in community groups. Um, and, and so all, all that value is, is extracted um, when, when community assets are eliminated um, or, or, or pushed out of our community. Um, and so, you know, we really think that one, one really exciting benefit of, of bringing these properties into Community ownership is that we actually are preserving and securing that community equity, and we can assure that that equity is invested both first in making sure that that those land and assets continue to be available to community members, um, specifically equity seeking community members, but also um, that that equity is recycled or cycled to to see us grow our impact to continue to invest in these important um, assets such as affordable housing. And so that's a little bit about, about our, our organization and I'll end it there. Um, and so um, thank you for, for li listening to a little bit about the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust. Um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite um, our, our second last speaker, which is Tiffany DeZita um, from the Community Land Trust Foundation of British Columbia. Um, and Tiffany, um, as with the other speakers, I'm gonna invite you to actually just scale your introduction um, and build it into uh, your presentation. Um, the floor is yours, thank you so much. Uh, sure, uh, thank you uh, everybody for attending today. and. As Josh mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Community Land Trust out in BC. And I've been asked to speak today about the evolution of our Community Land Trust uh, that's actually happened 
over the past three decades, but really with a focus on the past five years. And really what happens when you look at a CLT model from a perspective that has no real geographic boundary, uh, it can go beyond just holding land, and whose goal uh, for the number of homes can actually be uh, limitless. Uh, the first slide that you're kind of seeing here, it's, it's actually important to recognize that the Community Land Trust is part of a group of social enterprises that's led by the Cooperative Housing Federation of BC. We heard some of the earlier speakers talking about how CLTs in Canada have, have a lot of origins in the cooperative housing sector, and it's no different with ours out in BC. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, the Cooperative Housing Federation of BC, or CHFBC as we like to refer to them as, is a member association whose primary stakeholders are housing cooperatives. They also own Coho Management Service Society, which is a professional management company providing services to housing cooperatives, and the group and organization that I represent, uh, which is the Community Land Trust, or CLT. You'll hear me refer to the acronym as I go through my presentation, which is a nonprofit social purpose real estate developer whose purpose is to create, preserve, and steward permanently affordable homes. Uh, it's important to note, because we are a sector-based community land trust, that we have a unified mission, voice, and governance structure that brings the strength and knowledge and expertise and expert and reputation to that table for, for investment, uh, for housing and land, into, and actually funding and financing. Uh, CHFBC is actually the, the only uh, member that we have of the community land trust. And that sole member is made up of the 12 board members that are elected to the CHFBC board. So what you see here is kind of our CLT growth timeline from our early stages, and it hasn't happened overnight. Uh, we've actually been in existence since 1993, and we originally started as a, as a charity, and our original land trust did have a, and still does, have a charitable status. And it was original intent was hoping that it would receive land uh, from uh, charitable donations, and that actually never came to be and it was almost a decade later where it received six properties from varying levels of government that now consist of five co-ops and one nonprofit. Um, and the CLT also at that time wasn't even really um, heavily involved in the governance structure or even the community building side of the community land trust. I often describe our, our history and our relationship uh, with the properties of more like we acted like an absentee landlord. But then we fast forward uh, to 2012, which is what we refer to in our timeline here in our history as kind of our breakthrough and how the CLT was used as a growth vehicle for cooperative and nonprofit housing in the city of Vancouver, as we were awarded uh, four sites and embarked on a portfolio of 358 homes. And we're proud to say the last building of that original portfolio that sparked our growth a few years ago uh, was just completed last week. We had our first resident move in and we'll have the bulk of the members, new members moving into that co-op in September and early this fall. Um, but then knowing that we could build these 358 homes, the questions started being asked about, well, how many more can we actually build? And that's when the investment in capacity building was initiated in 2015. Because if you want to look at a CLT model for growth, you also need to look at your internal capacity and what that needs to be. So from 2015 to today, we've seen tremendous growth in the number of homes in our portfolio. We've been buying existing stock that would either be lost from the sector, we're uh, building new housing stock, we're buying turnkey buildings as, as well, and investing also with land transfers from the cooperative housing sector in, into the land trust. Uh, so in the past five years, we've grown from about 358 homes to just under 3,000 that are either occupied or under construction or will be starting construction uh, th later this year or in 2021. And we're working every day on more opportunities and especially uh, are excited about some acquisition opportunities that are gonna be happening out in here in BC. Next slide, please. But as we've experienced this significant growth, um, this has challenged us to look at our governance structure and build even more capacity. Because uh, like we experienced growth in a really short period of time and how to take a step back and really ask ourselves some hard questions on our, on our governance and our capacity and where we were gonna go in the future to continue not only delivering on the promises that we had made with um, those, those 3,000 homes, but to continue to actually build our portfolio. 
And given that investment that we had attracted from our funders, our municipal land partners, our co-op partners, we knew that we needed to focus on our long-term viability and sustainability. So to have the success of that viability and sustainability, we need to take that step and look at four key components to have clarity within our mission, have that strong governance, sound management for financial maintenance, repair, asset management, legal and communication, education and reporting, and that long-term planning that wraps up all those three components for uh, strong sustainability and viability. So in late 2018, we did complete a governance restructuring, which you heard me speak to in that first slide where we saw the unified governance under the CHFBC umbrella. Uh, and then in 2019, we focused on our business plan that included identifying our core capacities and also our growth plan of where we wanted to be in the next one to three years. And this was really needed and is needed for anybody that wants to look at a CLT from scaling up perspective to deliver housing at that scale to attract those investors, um, not only for land, but money and also additional partners that you may need involved. Next slide, please. So our CLT really looks at all of our land holdings uh, from a portfolio approach. This doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're all linked together, um, but because we do have sound legal agreements that separate municipal land ownerships from different cities, how we separate our financing, et cetera. But what's key here is whether it's freehold land or leasehold land, uh, the CLT is the owner of the title interest or the long-term in leasehold interest. And we are responsible for that maintenance, repair, asset management, and the debt servicing. And that gives our partners a level of risk management to invest in one organization that can deliver a wide variety of housing to a broad population. So as you can see here, we have a mixture of housing co-ops and nonprofit organizations. And some of our nonprofits also have different other sub partnerships with other nonprofits to even deliver a deeper level of affordability in the developments. Um, we end up uh, entering, since we're the landowner or the leasehold owner, uh, we do enter into leases or subleases with our nonprofits and their co-op partners. And then they're responsible for their own governance and their own communities. Uh, CLT has also embarked uh, through a partnership and, um, and ownership through CHFBC with third party partnerships with various organizations that need to find safe homes and communities for their clients who are not, um, and these are the organizations that might not necessarily be housing providers, but have lots of clients that need housing. And we're currently working with organizations like Community Living Society and BC Society of Transition Homes. And we've made it a mandate in all of our projects that a certain number of homes are allocated to these groups. And we hope to in the future be able to expand these partnerships and invite others in. Uh, we can also pool um, our reserves and our resources across that portfolio. And now we're actually just getting to the scale side as well, where we're actually getting our operational efficiencies as well and getting those economies of scale by having such a large number of homes in the portfolio. Next slide, please. Um, but with growth in a very short time um, comes challenges and you do have a lot of eyes on you as well that are asking questions um, or raising their voices with concern. Uh, so we realized that in order to be successful, we needed to focus on things that went beyond just running a performa and understanding the numbers and, and, and the bricks and mortar of just building the housing. Because without that traditional CLT model with that tripartite governance, uh, we really needed a way to connect with our partners and people that were living in the buildings and especially with our co-op partners. So throughout um, this past year and into 2021 uh, will be another growth period for, for us. Um, not necessarily in the size of the portfolio, but this will really be about a time about how we engage and collaborate with our partners. Um, we're embarking on things like you can see here with our social priorities approach, community building toolkits, member partner and engagement framework, and working on what we refer to as the co-op cafe to really engage people into difficult um, conversations that they're facing today and tomorrow um, so that we can plan better and maybe that the CLT can actually be a solution for the things that they're seeking. And, but part of that, we're looking at dialing in our capacity, like I said, engaging and not being afraid of having those difficult conversations, being very solution oriented and really allowing people to be at the table and working with us for key decisions. Next slide, please. 
So this is just a slide of showing a range of, of housing that we either are now occupied or underway. And as you can see that we have a lot of growth and what we build are quite large buildings. And it's important for us to find those ways to keep people from our communities involved into the CLT without that traditional tripartite governance model. Uh, and it really is a, a work in progress and one that we're working on uh, daily and we'll continue to work on with our co-ops and nonprofit partners. Um, and hopefully maybe a year from today, because uh, it's very hard to measure social outcomes, but hopefully a year today we'll have some more data and stories to show with people about some of the social outcomes that we're really focusing on our housing developments. And you can see a wide variety of here. Um, we have everything in these pictures from co-ops to nonprofits, and we're also um, working with uh, um, to build our first uh, building with First Nations communities and also working with other different supportive housing nonprofits um, with uh, women, uh, women and children escaping domestic violence. So um, that's it for my presentation today, because I'm sure people, there's another presenter and probably a Q&A session as well. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Uh, I'm just going to invite uh, Melissa Estable of the Cooperative Housing Federation of Toronto to say a few words about the Canadian Community Land Trust Network, and then we will uh, be getting, we're getting close to the question period, and I've been documenting the questions. Melissa, are you uh, there? So I'm not hearing Melissa on the line. Can you all hear my voice? So Melissa, please feel free to interrupt me um, if, uh, if you're able to figure out your audio. Uh, but I'll, I'll just, just for the sake of time, um, move forward on and, and help share some of this shared content of, of the network. I can hear um, you all the way into Montreal, Josh. Thank you, thank you. Um, so um, just to say that, you know, in recent years we started a network and we're trying to use this, the network as an ad hoc space to, to sort of have these types of, of, of sharing, of peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Um, and to, to, to bring up important issues around the community land trust and, and show, you know, this one for specifically is looking at some of the historical projects and the emergence of new projects. Um, there are um, around 20 members who are active in the network, um, so it's organizations, as well as other interested groups that are exploring the potential of creating a community land trust. Uh, we first met in 2017 in Oakland, actually. We were invited by the Community Land Trust Network of the United States called Grounded Solutions to their conference. Um, and, uh, and so uh, a number, a number of, of people went to that. We had about 30 Canadians there. We had a first um, discussion and some strategic goals were identified, um, centering social justice in CLT development, um, building alliances and broadening the table and recognition of the CLT model by government. So, you know, those are priorities that the group is working on. Uh, we had a, another gathering in Montreal in 2019 and some additional goals were identified um, the Co-op Housing Federation of Canada um, stepped up to trustee the, the, the ad hoc group and sort of play a role of coordinating this group for one year. Um, there was a, an interest in increasing peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing um, and also uh, an interest in securing staff to consolidate the network and also um, to be able to hire technical assistants, um, which would be basically consultants that could go and help um, groups who are trying to initiate um, uh, new CLTs or having trouble with their CLTs to sort of move their CLTs forward and so to help help spread the model and, and share resources. Um, so um, I'm going to pass the, the microphone back to Sue just to discuss a few emerging issues and then we're going to jump to the question period. If you haven't yet put your questions in the chat box, please take time to do it now. Um, and I've been checking in with some of the people who have asked questions to see if they'd like to ask their question. But, but please also, if you put a question in, let me know if you'd like to say your question in your own voice or if you'd like us to read it. Sue? Okay, great. Thanks, Josh. Um, just keeping this short, I wanted to, to stress that the CLT model is, is that is one that unfortunately and very problematically hasn't historically engaged with Indigenous land rights in the North American context. But as Stephanie and others have mentioned today, in the U.S. it has been very much focused on gaining land rights for African American residents and as part of the civil rights movement. So as others have noticed, noted in the comments section, which I've been reading today, a very key issue in thinking about the current and future growths, growth of community land trusts in Canada is the importance of Indigenous land rights and traditional Indigenous land stewardship practices, working with Indigenous community in CLT practices, so a relationship between settler, settler colonists and Indigenous communities, 
and building a, a, a respectful partnership and a necessary growth of indigenous led CLTs in Canada. So CLTs with their focus on collective land ownership can have an important role to play in the decolonization of settler colonial cultural and land based processes. In relation to the indigenous land back movement, we can think about CLTs as being one possible method and conduit for indigenous land sovereignty. So an example that I'm becoming more familiar with, which is unfortunately not a Canadian example, but I think a, a really interesting model for a woman led indigenous led uh, land trust is the Sigoria Tay Land Trust in the East Bay area of San Francisco. And this land trust actually created a Shumi land tax, which is a gift land tax, which asks non-Indigenous area residents who live on traditional territory, on the traditional territory, to donate money on a voluntary basis to the land trust organization in order to support land trust activities such as land uh, acquisition. So in relation to Indigenous sovereignty, uh, as I mentioned here, it is also important to center Black communities and other people of color in Canadian CLT practices is integral. Um, and in such as the work, uh, important work as Hogan, of Hogan, Hogan's Alley Society. Um, so lastly, just uh, as a kind of a, going back to the model of the CLT, um, I, I'd like to identify the emergence of coalition based CLTs as a model or an increasingly uh, common model, uh, which we see in the US and the UK, where individual neighborhood based CLT organizations connect with a larger CLT umbrella organization in a sort of coalition uh, way or coalition focused way um, that in encompasses the whole city. So an example that I'm currently researching is the London Community Land Trust in the UK. And this is an interesting model of how to scale up the neighborhood based CLT to a pan city type of CLT network, taking on the individual characteristics of the neighborhood based CLTs and keeping those really important and front and center in the work. So apologies for having to move this through these very important issues quickly due to time, but I hope we can discuss more in the question and answer to follow. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sue. So uh, the first question in our question and answer period um, is going to be coming um, from um, Ushnish Sengupta. And uh, I asked Ushnish if, if, um, if it would be a preference to read the question or, or offer them the opportunity. And, and they asked for us to read it. So question on racial equity, do you collect and publish data on land trust members and residents to determine if there are inequalities and assumably in that context, we're thinking of inequalities in terms of who's accessing the land trust on lands and housing, et cetera. Um, and so um, I'm assuming that that question is going to all the speakers who are operating land trusts. So does anyone just feel free to jump in if, uh, if you have an answer to give those speakers who are thinking about their answers a moment, uh, I'll, I'll start by answering for us for the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust. So um, for, the, for the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust, um, we haven't historically had um, stats, for example, on who is living on, on or living or working on the lands that we own because we, we've actually only recently been able to be, you know, have the honor of stewarding some land and housing. However, we are, uh, we, we, we do now um, have, you know, we, we have a process of gathering that information and there is an intention to consistently look at our work and analyze whether we feel that we are um, you know, um, serving equity seeking communities, whether there are racial inequities in, the, in access to, to the sites that we own. Um, so there's an interest in that. We have a, a committee of the organization, which is called an equity strategy committee, which is a space where board members, members and staff collaborate to think about ways in which um, the work that we do can increasingly address uh, issues of equity. Um, we're still very, very early in, in those processes. and. Um, and so um, I think in future years, we'll have a better answer to this question around whether the work we're doing is, is, um, is serving a, um, you know, a, diverse, a diverse audience, is serving um, racialized individuals or not. And I, I, unfortunately, today, I cannot answer that just due to our the fact that we're very new to this. Hi, it's Stephanie here. I can give a bit of an answer as well. Um, what we know about Canadian statistics and reporting 
is that disaggregated data is uh, there is a, just a dearth. There is it's 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 a um, a very absent uh, aspect of policy to collect, report, and understand disaggregation by race um, in Canada. This is across health sectors, education, and housing is included in that. Um, at BC Housing, we are endeavoring to do better by that um, through our various programs and systems. And I'd mentioned that the um, the homeless count this year did include a race question, but it is a really unfortunate aspect of Canadian colorblindness, which I would call racism blindness, um, which is really intentional and systemic. Um, because of course, if we don't measure it, then we don't have to address it. And it is a, a long-standing issue that uh, we don't have those kinds of statistics. We don't study them, and therefore we don't include them in our policy formation. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, would anybody else uh, on the panel like to, to answer this question? Right. Um, I, yes, if we don't, um, if we don't study it, we aren't going to know about it. And I agree. Um, the difficulty of doing that kind of uh, training and checking right now for organizations large as Colanco and the other land trust in Toronto is tough. What we're trying to focus on, which is equally difficult, is to ensure that there is absolutely no discrimination around moving in. Half our members are coming off a government waiting list. I can't promise you that that makes it uh, transparent, but at least it, it reduces the amount of um, uh, uh, opportunities for discrimination. But I think that it is a, a major question that needs to be addressed and uh, we don't have a really good solution right now, but thank you. Um, any other CLTs want to answer this question and then we'll maybe we'll move to another question because I think there's some related questions. So um, Tiffany, anyone else? Okay, so next I'm going to invite Nico Kassan Kad, sorry for the improper pronunciation of your last name, um, to, to ask your question, Nico. Um, Please, uh, um, please feel free to, 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 to ask your question in your own words. Great, okay, sounds good. Um, thank you so much everyone. I really appreciated learning from each and every one of you just in terms of the Canadian movement of CLTs. Um, so my name's Nico, I use he and him pronouns and I'm a researcher at Arts Pond in Toronto. And one of my tasks right now is to research um, and create a toolkit on educating young BIPOC individuals in the arts and culture sector so that they can learn more about community land trusts. But mm. I'm just sort of curious to see from everyone's else experiences with advocacy, protesting, um, and getting community buy-in, what are some tips or advice do you have to uh, um, ensure that we can help inspire young BIPOC and other equity-seeking um, youth in our cities to potentially create their own CLT in the future. Would anybody like to start? Um, um, maybe I can talk just because we probably are the only um, BIPOC representation or a land trust at the table. Um, what I would say, Nico, I really appreciate the question, is that, um, you know, it's important to come to terms with the fact that if any organization is operating from a position of norms or um, has not done a deep equity analysis, then that organization is upholding the status quo. And we know the status quo is discriminatory and exclusionary. So it has to be something that's approached very intentionally. And it requires people that have not only lived experience, but critical analysis and understands how to support that. So I think what you'll find is that there's not a lot of blueprints out there that is going to be informative for 
organizing from the position of racialized people, of indigenous people, until you go to those sources. Um, there is a land trust that has started up in Vancouver by Luma Native Housing. Uh, they're, they're working on that and developing that. So that's one indigenous land trust that I'm aware of working in an urban area. And of course, there's Hogan's Alley Society working in urban areas uh, with the priority of supporting people of African descent. Um, but unfortunately, we know that if we don't get intentional on these aspects of what we do, um, that these we will continue to exacerbate and pr and and prolong and and uphold these structural inequities, uh, which default us to to really white supremacy, ableism, um, you know, uh, and patriarchy. So it's it's one of those things that we've just really got to shift our thinking of in this sector and become much more intentional about. John Davis. Yeah, I would just add, uh, Nico, that in the United States, we have not done nearly enough to raise up to include the next generation of leaders in our movement down in the in the U.S., particularly leaders, technical assistance providers, trainers of color. There is a wonderful chapter in On Common Ground written by Tony Pickett. And the, uh, the title of it is The Burden of Patience in a Long March Toward Racial Justice. Tony is the executive director of Grounded Solutions Network in the US. And he himself is an African-American. He is a leader of our movement and he has challenged the entire movement to do better and to, as we call it, build the bench, expand the bench, include more people. So we've acknowledged we've got a problem down here. We haven't figured out how to solve it, but I think that your interest in growing that next generation is similar to Tony's, and I would encourage you to get in touch with Tony or get in touch with me and I will get the two of you together. Any other speakers want to step in and uh, and comment on on the question? Uh, yeah, I would like to say something, John. Demetri, yep, please. I just want to remind everybody of a little bit of history. Um, the cooperative movement uh, was founded in Rochdale in 1844, and amongst its ten principles. It included one person, one vote, complete gender equality, and no tolerance for racial discrimination. And if any member of a co-op uh, stood in the way of any one of these three and the other seven principles, that was grounds for expulsion. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, Nico, I, I just wanted to say that as a, as a, as a group in representing a group in, in Toronto, I mean, I think that we, like the, the Park the Neighborhood Land Trust, we have a, quite, quite a few members as well as staff who are, are really interested in, in working with other emerging groups in Toronto uh, and uh, would be really interested to talk to you about, you know, share the work we're doing in any way, collaborate, partner, um, think about, um, you know, uh, um, having placements in our organization to support uh, staff, uh, interested folks and in other organizations to, to get some uh, in internal organizational experience, um, even uh, sharing staff, uh, um, sharing initiatives. So we're definitely open to, to, to collaborating. And I think, Nico, I would just encourage, you know, we should try to find an opportunity to meet soon and, and, um, and just and, and brainstorm. And I'd love to hear your ideas as well. Um, I wanted to um, ask if uh, Cheyenne Sundance would like to ask a question or make a comment. Um, Cheyenne shared many comments on the on the chat, and so I wanted to make space for for Cheyenne. If, if Cheyenne would like to to take some space, I don't see her on the list anymore, Josh. Okay, um, I just want to. Okay, uh, does does anyone else want to verbalize a question? We're just reaching the end of our of our um, session, so. Um, if you do, I would encourage you to unmute yourself and start to speak. Um, and uh, we can probably get in one more question. 
Uh, Josh, I have a question for whoever wants to answer it amongst the panelists. Okay. Uh, it's in two parts. Uh, first, uh, are any of the organizations that are represented here today by one of the panelists uh, affiliated with the Right to the City movement? Uh, question number one. Uh, I think we will only have time for one question. There's three minutes left. Right, fine. Um, see, see, who, see, who's, see who can answer that question. Um, so I can tell you that in the Park Down Neighborhood Land Trust is in contact with the Right to the City Alliance, which is a, a group of, of organizing groups, community organizing groups throughout the U.S. Um, who are um, primarily groups that, have, uh, uh, that are organizing out of communities of color. Um, and are racialized communities. And um, we definitely are, are in touch with them. We attend some of their webinars. Um, we go to their events sometimes. We try to, to find ways to be um, allies and, and collaborate. Stephanie, have you had any touch? Have you been in touch with the Right to City Alliance? Uh, forgive me if my memory fails me, but I feel like we have. Um, I think there's a strong sense of solidarity um in the premise of what right to the city is all about because of the very nature of our work um and we're very rooted in the principles of justice equity inclusion diversity and belonging just our, our whole organization is founded on those principles and the work we're doing is completely centered on that thank you so much um so i think that we've 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 reached the end of our time i would like to thank all of the people who attended this webinar to hear about community land trusts in canada and i hope that many of you are actually um active in the in the movement or um in uh, allied or movements uh, and that we can work together moving forward i want to encourage um, the participants the people who, who who came to this session that if you feel that there's topics that we need to organize around both webinars as well as actual actions, please contact us um, and we can collaborate um, to bring those additional activities together. Um, I wanted to thank John Davis um, for inviting uh, Sue and I to help to document some of this history and for being an amazing persistent organizer in this uh, community land trust movement internationally for bringing together this book and, and just also being gracious with your time to be here today with us. I'd also like to thank all the speakers. Um, of course, thank you, um, John. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Dimitri, Stephanie Allen, Tiffany, uh, Melissa, we missed you. Um, Teresa, we missed you. And, um, and then all of the, the folks who offered, um, who offered great questions, comments, and, and critiques that we definitely need to take seriously and work on. Um, uh, without further ado, I just wanna now say goodbye. I hope everyone has a good evening. Uh, and we will be sharing the video of this um, online. So please uh, share it with anyone you think may be, ha um, may be interested. And don't forget to read the book. <laughs> don't forget to read the book. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. Goodbye.